My name is Adrienne Lent Smith. I'm an associate professor in history um, with secondary appointments in AAAS and in g gender, sexuality, and feminist studies. Um, and I am going to take advantage of this panel to hold you captive to the meanderings of the inside of my brain. Um, and I will try to be succinct about that, um, but just to give you full warning, that's what's going to happen. Um, I proposed a talk called Global Histories of Local Violence. Um, it's a talk that has a story and then a lot of questions. Um, and so questions that I am actually going to ask you rather than try to answer myself. Um, and here's how it's gonna work. I'm about to tell you an account of something that's going to make you wonder, why on earth is she talking about this in a, conf in a symposium that's on global blackness? And then um, we'll try to figure out why on earth I'm talking about this in a, in a symposium that's about global blackness. So I have found myself in um, the funny and unexpected position of having become a historian of the US and the world, um, which wasn't something that I planned to do. Um, part of me thinks that it's a product of having gone to the Society of Historians of, for Historians of American Foreign Relations Conference a couple of times and having people mistake me for Carol Anderson, the other black woman who goes to the Society, Historians of American Foreign Relation um, <laughs> Conferences, and being okay with that. Carol's wonderful. Um, she's, um, you know, she's got a perm and my hair is locked, but okay, you know. She just won like the National Book Critics Circle Award for her book, White Rage, so I'll just roll with it and take all of the accolades and the celebrations. Um, but I think also that, um, there, there is a logic um, to my having been in that space in the first place. My first book was on African Americans and the First World War, and part of what I was trying to think through in that book was um, about what it meant for everyday African Americans, not the W.E.B. Du Boises, not the people who'd made a career of imagining the world, but of people whose horizons had been deliberately and brutally limited by their quotidian experience to suddenly find themselves in the broad current of, of quite dramatic world events um, and their frames of understanding and their notions of community and kinship thus um, adjusted, challenged, and then adjusted. Um, so that's the background. But the project that I'm doing now actually jumps me ahead about, oh, 70 years, um, and takes me from thinking about people who traveled between the US South and the US North and between both of those places and Europe to thinking about a young man who spent his entire life not just in San Diego, but really in Southeast San Diego, California. Um, on May 31st, afternoon of May 31st, 23-year-old African-American man named Sagon Penn um, was driving a truck full of folks, neighborhood kids, home from a community event when the police in San Diego, California pulled him over. Um, this was 1985. It's the height of Southern California paranoia about gangs. Um, it is a configuration of um, African, or I'm sorry, configuration of Southern California cops who look and sound much like the cops that we would see as key players in the Rodney, or not in, well, in the Rodney King riots, but um, also in um, sort of the LA, the O.J. Simpson case in the following, following decade. And these policemen pull um, Penn over, demand to see his driver's license when Penn questions what right they have to pull him over, why they need to see his driver's license. The police, um, as these stories often go, begin to beat him. An uh, eight-year-old girl playing in the, uh, in the playground of the church next to where this happened 
recount seeing them kicking Ken, uh, Penn, um, shouting at him, and as she said in her testimony, saying over and over again, N-I-G-G-E-R, she spelled it out, she didn't say it. Um, this story would have been like many other stories that we heard then and continue to hear now, except that Penn was a brown belt in Taekwondo. Um, and at some point in the middle of this encounter, he disarmed the two policemen, shooting both with the policeman's gun, wounding one, wounding a civilian who was in the car in a police ride along, um, and killing one of the policemen. Penn um, then fled the scene, turned himself in a couple of hours later. As you can imagine, the newspaper coverage of this event um, screams, especially in these first few days, cop killer, cop killer, cop killer arrested, cop killer going to trial. Over the course of the trial, however, um, Penn's lawyer, who's himself a uh, sort of so, sort of attention hound celebrity lawyer, Milton Silverman in San Diego, Penn's lawyer begins to build an impressive case that the policeman who made the call to pull Penn over, Donovan Jacobs, is not just your run of the mill um, Southern California um, racist, but he's actually a uh, I train with paramilitary organizations in the desert in my weekends off kind of racist. Um, so racist, in fact, that the witnesses for the defense include a fellow police officer, now former fellow police officer, um, testifying about um, how J Jacobs was so racist that he was unfit um, for duty. It takes two trials, but Penn is acquitted. Um, two trials, two years. So he's in jail without bond, or uh, without bail for two years, basically. In the end, he's acquitted. Um, he remains in San Diego, and he shows up over and over again in newspaper accounts, in trial, um, in sort of court records, for small run-ins in the police, for um, the kind of everyday tragedies that make the afterlives of state violence. So he's in you know, family court for domestic violence things, for custody battles, until in 2002, um, when he's 40 years old, so 17 years after the initial encounter, he commits suicide saying, they're never going to leave me alone, right? So what you have here is a story of a swift moving outrage and a slow moving tragedy. Um, and one that is, I think, evocative of any number of different things, um, but very much of the ways in which these sort of moments of dramatic state violence continue to do work. These moments of encounter continue to do awful, um, destructive, and devastating work f long after what we, we, what we tend to sort of recount in the sort of shorthand historical narratives. And you also see the ways in which these sort of individual encounters radiate out through communities, do work in destructive work within families, beyond families, so forth and so on. And that's a story that I could tell within these frames, within a very sort of African American history, civil rights um, and post-civil rights framework, right? Um, but I think it's a story that in order to fully understand what's going on and to really get its significance, needs something bigger even as the meat of the story really takes place in this corner of this one city in the corner of the United States. And so the question becomes, what makes this uh, um, a history of global blackness in some ways, right? Um, as a sort of sidebar, in order to 
to tell you how I'm thinking about answering that question, I'll explain that I came to this project by avoiding what was originally going to be my next project, or ne deciding that I needed to think a little bit more deeply about what was going to be my next project. Because I'm also really fascinated with Sam Greenlee, um, the author of The Spook Who Sat By The Door, who was, before he sort of like appeared on the scene as a sort of black, um, sort of black arts movement, black radical novelist, or maybe as he was emerging on that scene, was actually one of the first three African Americans um, to be hired by the U.S. Information Agency. And he served for the USIA in Jakarta um, in the, during the time of the coup that threw the monarch, not Jakarta, I'm sorry, Baghdad during the time of the coup that threw the monarchists out of power in Dhaka when it was East Pakistan, and then in Jakarta just sort of at the end of, of sort of Sukarno's time. Um, and so I used to read The Spook Who Sat By The Door and sort of greenly self-presentation as this sort of made up, sort of super, sort of hyperbolic narrative of black masculinity and sort of a, a romance of revolutionary violence that I didn't take terribly seriously. Um, but then in the wake of all of the instances of still egregious state violence that we've seen playing out on the streets over and over and over again, but especially crystallizing with Ferguson, I thought, you know, maybe I need to figure out, I need to learn to think through violence more seriously so that I can do the Greenlee project some justice, right? So going back to San Diego, thinking about Saigon Pen, thinking about this encounter through the kind of frames of analysis that Greenlee might have taken for granted has helped me to sort of begin to think about what this project is going to be. And for me right now, the key is to really think about San Diego as place, right? So here is this site that is a sunbelt town. Um, it is a town, it is a military town in incredibly um, significant ways. Mike Davis basically describes San Diego as a, what does he call it? Basically like a, a private utility um, run by a small oligarchy of people who've used the military industrial complex to enrich um, themselves, right? Um, it is at once, it's sort of, it's Pacific Rim in some ways, and you can see this the sort of minor, the sort of players at the edges of the Saigon stor Pen story, who the woman, the civilian who shot is, I think, um, having an affair with one of the policemen she's riding with, which is a whole other lurid part of the tale, but her partner is a Filipino navalman who's at sea in that moment and is very vocal in his outrage about what happens to her. Um, so it's Pacific Rim and it's also south, it's also sort of southwest borderlands, right? The metro in San Diego stops in Tijuana. And so thinking about how different understandings of place and empire shape um, both understandings and sort of exercises of power in San Diego, um, and who is counted as a citizen in San Diego is crucially important to understanding the dynamics of what unfold um, it, within the Saigon Pen case, but then also in as much as the rest of Southern California reads what happened subsequently in Southern California through the lens of the Saigon Pen case, which I think is true that the, um, that the sort of, as sort of events move up to LA, the police narratives about police being in danger and unprotected inform then how they respond to criminals in, in sort of LA areas, right? All of these things, all of these dynamics that are happening within the Penn case then bleed into um, these other bigger narratives that we tend to know more about. So that's what I think, but I'm curious during the Q&A to hear what you think, because I'm really in the early stages of this project and just trying to wrap my head around both the story and, well, my own head, which is really what writing is about anyway. Okay. 
I'm Dasha Chapman. I'm the postdoc in African and African American Studies. Um, and this paper sort of unexpectedly arose after seeing a performance last weekend. So um, I was moved to talk about it. Haitian diaspora choreographer Jean Apollon's recent dance theater creation, Laku Aiti, which premiered by his dance company Jaye, Jean Apollon Expressions, in Boston last weekend, dwells on the Haitian Laku and its loss in the Haitian imagination as a way to reflect on the immigrant experience and the concept of home. Having been in development through workshops with Boston Haitian and other immigrant communities for over two years, the piece's current time, timeliness only illuminates how enduringly relevant the theme is. As Angela Davis has been saying in interviews for at least, at least 10 years, quote, the struggle for immigrant rights is the key struggle of our times, and it is a struggle for civil rights, it is a struggle for human rights. Lorja Garcia Pena recently articulates um, in relation to this quote with respect to the 2013 Dominican constitutional court ruling that denationalized tens of thousands of Dominicans of Haitian descent, the ways in which processes of racialization tied to US imperial interventions throughout the Americas historically undergird the precarities of citizenship and continue to sustain structures of hemispheric anti-black sentiment and oppression. Apollon's mission in Laku IT, fueled by his work in movement and dialogue with diverse Boston immigrants as well as his, as his commitment to Haiti's foundational call, Tut Moon Sein Moon, every person is a person, was to demonstrate a shared living, an immigrant story that spoke of specific Haitian experiences through Haitian repertoires, yet resonated broadly. The specific Dominican Haitian story was rendered in the performance of um, in only one piece called Bate. The word la coup, as the show's program notes tell, uh, tell us, quote, carries many meanings. It is the backyard, the land passed down through generations, and the gathering place for shared meals, for dancing, singing, worship, or passionate debate. La coup can also mean home, or the idea of home, the place that calls us back, not just to sacred ground, but to a sense of belonging without which we are not whole. The Laku is a Haitian form of social organization founded as a revolutionary counter plantation modality of endurance and support. The Laku emerged in revolutionary Saint Domingue, colonial Haiti, as a ground up resistant response to the assault on social life constituted by enslavement grounded by a knowledge that no ground is one's own when one is deemed movable property, the laku signifies a radical claim to place, personhood, and kinship. Central to the lifeways of the laku is vodou and its collective labors. In Apollon's laku IT, vodou rhythms layer into washes of black sonic evocation and sacredly inflected movements transform into urgent motion. Jan Valu's characteristic serpentine flow morphs into vigilant angles, cascades of gesture, dispersals and gatherings, and the partnered sharing of weight. Here, Jan Valu, Vaudou's foundational corpus of rhythm, movement, and mythopoetic repertoire that encodes Dambala, the serpent spirit's ancestral wisdom and ability for continuous renewal, becomes effortful and full of intent. Jan Valu's smooth snake-like flow is punctuated by tilts, sharp action, and sweeps into suspension. The body shudders, then collapses, but promptly recovers. The torso repeatedly fans with concerted force. There is an urgency and velocity to the, this Jan Valu that critically mobilizes for our charged present. The vital soundscape for Laku IT was created by Brooklyn-based Haitian sound artist Val Janti. Janti layered vodou rhythms with Afro-electronic inventions inflected by a varied black diaspora aesthetic, including Rara's driving pulse, house grooves, gospel swells, and hip hop beats. Janti's score also weaved in migration narratives from Apollon himself and other Haitians living in the US, part of his community, reflecting on the promises and perils of residing in a place that demands you erase significant parts of yourself, as well as the multi as well as the multiple meanings of home for each of them. In the midst of this sonic texture and against a backdrop of Haiti's struggles, 
we hear Apollon's story, which highlights his father's brutal, politically motivated murder and the ways the violent period of insecurity following Aristide's first removal from power shaped the uncertainties of a Haitian life. There isn't room for everything, though. Apollon's queerness and the significant Haitian gay community in Boston to which he is central are carried through in unannounced ways. They are present, however, in the feminine inflections and embodied power of his technique, his choices in movement and subject matter, and his support crew and audience. In my few moments here, I'd like to focus on Laku Aiti's final gesture, which I believe points us elsewhere. The company's one Haitian dancer, Jean-Sébastien Duvillier, appears on stage with a brown paper bag. He bends down and begins to shake yellow cornmeal in a line bisecting the stage. As he crosses the top of the line, the other five dancers join him with their own brown bags. Each meets at a point along, a cent along this center line and draws an arcing spiral outwards. The imperfect, singular swirls speak of difference in collective. As an ensemble, they have drawn a veve for Aizan. Veve are ephemeral cornmeal drawings made on the ground that call down specific spirits in Vodou ceremony. As signatures of the Loa, the Vodou spirits, Veve perform a grounding reminiscent of flight, characteristic of Vodou's fugitive clandestine modes. Political philosopher Neil Roberts' recent study, Freedom as Maronage, explores freedom as a form of perpetual flight practiced by Caribbean Maroons, specifically those in colonial Haiti who comprise the revolutionary armies. While Roberts argues, quote, movement is the central principle of Maronage, he does not once mention dance. The Haitian Revolution, we could say, was catalyzed by a Vodou ceremony in which enslaved peoples danced for their spirits as fortifying resource to rise up, resist colonial domination, and risk everything for the right to have rights. To recognize that Haiti, the first black republic, is indebted to danced resistance is to acknowledge the central place collective movement plays in liberation, political imagination, and the cultivation of place. Roberts presents a concept of veve architectonics, or as he puts it, imagined blueprints of freedom. However, in Vodou practice, veve are created only to be then danced over by congregants. What if we take the veve's ephemeral call for collective dancing as a fundamental component of its orientation toward freedom? And heeding Apollon's vision, what if this veve is not Papa Legba's or Ogu de Salines, but Aizan? Resembling a palm frond, Aizan's veve is linked to the palm on Haiti's flag, and it is interpreted as pronouncing liberty. Aizan presides over spiritual initiation and is a patron saint of the Vodou temple, the Unfor. Her palms protect and purify new initiates as she oversees their rebirth. She also signifies unity. She is the mother bearing spiritual knowledge. Aizan signals care, reinvention, and the emergence of a new nation. The Veve's architectonics marks space as sacred and opens the way as a blueprint of freedom. The Veve's ephemerality reminds us of its emergence under duress. It is a necessary action, a freedom practice that both signals and nurtures the creation of place and personhood. A personhood linked to ancestral and spiritual connections as well. Laku Aiti's shared drawing of a new Veve, an Aizan that hasn't been imagined before, proposes possible respatializations re of belonging in terms of the Laku. Through a Laku epistem, Apollon offers a mode of radical emplacement that recalls and refounds central principles of Haitian affiliation. This veve for Aizan, for Alaku Aiti, provides a reterritorialization. The dance space is sanctuary for Apollon. In the spaces he forges for dance, much like the provision grounds Sylvia Winter describes, resistant fortifying cultural practices are cultivated and nurtured. Aizan's wisdom coalesces here with Apollon's physical confirmation of feminine power, an expansion and intensification of the chest and hips that imbues his technique and thus his dancers. <clears throat> 
In La Kuaiti, Aizan's veve and the dancing that preceded it signal coalitional movement, movement that builds upon the recognition of global blackness and its spiritual and ancestral accompaniments as foundational to all our humanity, to rethinking not only configurations of migration and home, but their attendant formations of humanness and of blackness. Tut Mun Se Mun is aligned with the ways the nation's declaration of independence in, 1805, in 1804 reimagined the word neg or black as the term for person or citizen. All Haitians were to be known by the generic domination of blacks, neg. This is including the Polish soldiers who abandoned Napoleon's forces and fought on the side of the Maroon armies. Blackness revisioned as a political identity, claimed humanness and the right to have rights the right to be free. This bold visionary move also certainly sentenced Haiti to be cast as Gina Ulysse terms the nation, the bete noire of the Americas. Yet Apollon's mobilization of the powerful feminine and his heralding of Aizan as the call for unity, the mother who oversees all initiation into this new laku, reminds us that neg is still gendered masculine and that while all Haitian citizens were neg, they were also only men. The revolution in its successes are continuously imagined through, as Roberts puts it, sovereign male founding father figures. The history could be written differently, perhaps as a veve. Caribbean thinkers and black feminists and practitioners have theorized black diasporic practice as having generative imaginative, imaginative possibilities that in their emergence from states of cramp, as Wilson Harris has put it, or from tight spaces to evoke evoke Mackie and Moten, um, that in their emergence, sorry, these embodied practices foster forms of corporeal kinetic consciousness that actually produce time, space, and subjectivity in emancipatory modes. What I'm suggesting here is an attention to the resistant collective modalities forged in the crucible of colonialism and revolution like Vodou and the Laku, um, and an attention to the ways that they still inform embodied practice in the continuously unfree conditions and insecure environments of our contemporary era. Laku IET proposes a coming together in difference that requires a language developed collectively through Haitian spiritual technologies and the queer black feminist principles they evoke and invoke. The dancers did not dance over the veve at the end of the performance. We're left with this stark image, its imperfect swirls conjuring a multiplicity of unanticipated futures. What kind of ritual choreography is necessary to call down this spirit, Aizan of this laku? Veve are typically drawn at the beginning of a ceremony. In this drawing, which comes at the end of performance, is itself a beginning and an opening. It's a call. Toward what? It seems Apollon is telling us we must come down and dance to find out. Thank you. Hi, my name is Charlie Pio. Um, I have uh, spent the last 25 years working uh, in uh, French West Africa, uh, the little country of Togo. Um, and from the beginning, my work has been um, among other things, an attempt to um, think about uh, place, space, the area in which I work, which is, uh, was originally a set of fairly remote villages in the north of Togo, uh, but to think them through um, black Atlantic diasporic imaginaries in part, um, and drawing on Gilroy's uh, uh, term of the black Atlantic. Um, and so to think the way in which these remote villages um, were completely remade during the period of the Atlantic slave trade, um, then remade again through uh, the colonial, uh, 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 which was, of course, a raced um, uh, European project, um, and then through the post-colonial, and ways in which uh, these larger sort of rubrics and uh, contexts and frameworks have uh, informed the local. Um, so that's the work that I've been working on for, for many years, um, and, and always to think this area through uh, larger processes of the global and the modern, uh, and so on. 
and a sort of um, race to modern. Um, I, I, I want to make uh, sort of three points. These are these are um, sort of notes towards um, a, a project that I'm working on um, right now on migration out of the continent, and I'll get to that as the as as the third the third point of register. Um, the first one is that um, race for people in this area is not um, a uh, a sort of go-to category for them. It's not a foundational category. Um, ethnicity is, gender is, age is, um, but race isn't. Um, and there's, they're, 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 they're very obvious um, sort of political economic reasons uh, for this. Uh, East Africa was a European settler uh, space. South Africa, of course, but Kenya, Tanzania, um, and, and so on. Uh, West Africa was not, largely because of the Anopheles mosquito. Uh, it was called the white man's grave during uh, the period of the slave trade and during the period of the colonial. Um, at the end of colonialism, Kwame Nkrumah famously announced, it was a joke, but uh, that they should, they should erect a statue to the Anopheles mosquito because it was thanks to the mosquito that uh, European settlers never came to uh, Ghana. Um, so during the colonial period, uh, of, of course, during the slave trade period, uh, Europeans set up shop at the coast but didn't go into the interior during the colonial period. Uh, all of colonialism was run through indirect rule, so through African chiefs in, in areas like this, in remote areas like this. Um, and um, um, there were a very f small number of, uh, uh, of Europeans uh, at, at, at the coast, in Togo and Ghana and so on. Um, so people in this area never, uh, you know, the sort, of, um, the sort of mirror of black white, right, uh, as a sort of identity mirror, um, was never um, a part of everyday reality. So the, the, I guess another way of putting this is that the Fanonian moment um, never um, uh, took place in, in, in areas like this. Um, and that largely persists into the present. Um, so that's my that's sort of my first uh, my, my my first set of reflections. The second is to bring um, global larger contexts, larger rubrics, global political economy into the into the conversation. Um, and as soon as you think slave trade, uh, colonialism, and a whole range of different iterations of the post-colonial now, um, all of those epochs, all of those eras are of course raced within Euro-American imag uh, imaginaries. Um, it was only because of, of, of uh, deeply racist, white supremacist imaginaries that something like the slave trade could happen. Uh, ditto for the colonial, uh, and certainly uh, today into the post-colonial. Um, so um, the question then becomes um, how uh, so, so, so through that, there's a sort of binary logic, a, uh, a European African or a European native binarism that is also raced as white, uh, black. Um, uh, at the same time, we need to recognize the ways in which these terms are overdetermined for people locally, that is, the ways in which they have multiple significations. Race is one of them, um, but the European is also... Uh, someone from far away, someone with means, someone with technology, um, and uh, the color signifier white is also overdetermined. So Lebanese in Togo and Ghana are also called white, Chinese are also white, and so on. So these are uh, complex, uh, overdetermined, multiply signifying um, terms. Um, so there's that sort of um, I would say part of everyday imaginaries as well. There's the sort of the first register that, that I, I discussed, um, that it's not a foundational category for people, but at a, at a more abstract level, at a, at a larger level, it's a, it's a deeply determining category for people. I'm interested in the ways in which the sort of dialectical relationship between those two um, and how race uh, enters into everyday consciousness or not. Um, alongside of 
sort of um, these larger rubrics and the sort of everydayness of race today. Um, there's a there's the the, the sort of uh, sphere of the virtual or the televisual. Um, people in cities and capitals, of course, watch TV every night, uh, and there they tend to gravitate towards. It used to be MTV. Today it's telenovelas, uh, but there's a lot of uh, interesting race uh, uh, dynamics going on in those. Um, of course, hip hop. Uh, skin whitening is uh, all the rage in uh, all of the capitals. Uh, and although when I've talked to people about it, and a lot of the people I know, uh, a lot women, it's not, it's, it's a deeply gendered practice. Um, they say we don't want to become white, we want to become metis. We want somewhere between uh, white and black. Um, but these, so these spheres are uh, sort of, I, I would say, enlargening, and um, the sphere of the virtual is becoming part of uh, everyday identity for, um, for people, in a, in, I think, in, a, in an important sense. Okay, my third, um, my third sort of register um, is to segue to my current project, which is on um, migration. I would certainly agree with Angela Davis's comment. I think um, the immigrant is the figure of our time in many ways, um, and uh, even more so today in Trump's uh, America. Um, the migrant, of course, um, is a deeply raced figure. Um, uh, think only about uh, the black bodies in boats uh, crossing the Mediterranean. These images appear. Uh, repeatedly in our newspapers uh, in, in Europe and in the US. Um, and uh, they, of course, have an uncanny resemblance to uh, the, the images of the Middle Passage of uh, boats crossing the Atlantic. Um, Ashil Mbembe has referred to um, migrants as the laboring nomads uh, of today's world. Uh, and there are indeed massive sort of repeoplings or repopulations of the world going on as people are uh, moving between continents. Uh, uh, over 60 million people on the move today, globally. Um, several million uh, leaving, uh, leaving West and Central Africa every year for Europe, uh, for the US. Uh, and many more would leave uh, if they could. Ashil also calls this the becoming black of the world. Um, and um, there was an editorial in the New York Times uh, a couple of years ago uh, called The Africanization of Europe. Um, so there is a fundamental shift in, in population going on today um, and, and uh, around the figure of the migrant, uh, uh, which um, I think is, is an always already uh, raced um, figure. Um, let me bring a, a, a little bit of political economy into this, and I, I, I very much appreciated uh, Pat's um, keynote yesterday because she um, uh, uh, privileges that and prioritizes that in a way that I, that I think we have to do when we're talking about uh, the global. Um, and um, it's, uh, I won't go on and on about the current moment, but of course it's a moment of finance capital, uh, the society of the spectacle, the logic of the market uh, is uh, first and foremost, uh, um, and so on and so on. But today it is also fundamentally a moment of the security state. Uh, and uh, states that are, are at, especially in places like the African continent, being enclaved and re-enclaved, populations are being incarcerated within countries, uh, it's very, very difficult to, to, to travel anymore, to, uh, certainly to get a visa. Uh, and all of the new technologies are brought into border control, uh, especially biometrics, uh, which is, of course, um, uh, turns citizens into number, uh, turns citizens into race and into biology. Um, and these are the technologies that are used to uh, keep, uh, keep people from traveling. Um, entire areas of the world uh, are being enclaved through the use of these technologies and through the, all of the sort of infrastructural anxieties and paranoia that, that, that courses through the world system today. Uh, making it harder and harder for uh, uh, people to travel. So, um, and uh, again, Pat's uh, talk yesterday, um, I, I think he used the phrase sovereignty's neediness. Um, there's a way, and I, I find that very apt for this material. Um, the, 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 and, and Trump's America, indeed, uh, is, 
a type of economic nationalism and racial nationalism, white, right, white sovereignty uh, nationalism, uh, that is becoming a sort of dominant um, uh, uh, signifier and 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 uh, I think rubric for um, uh, for for biopolit biopolitics today. Um, Okay, let me, let me uh, come back to the first set of points that I was raising and end with this. And it's back to this dialectic between sort of when does race become one's identity um, and uh, if it isn't entirely one's identity yet, what, what is the interplay between sort of inside and outside? Um, I was in... Um, I was in uh, Omaha, Nebraska a couple of weeks ago um, visiting some Togolese there. So I've been studying Togolese and West Africans more generally who leave uh, West Africa and it's not too much of an exaggeration to say that everyone in Togo, Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, Benin, Nigeria would leave for the US or Europe tomorrow if they could, if they could get visas. Um, why? Not because they dislike their homeland or want to escape their families, but because of precarity at home, uh, and uh, both economic and political uh, precarity at home. Uh, so there's a massive desire to leave, and I've been um, looking at how they leave, but also the imaginaries of, of, uh, of Europe and the West and so on. Um, on the one hand, on the other hand, I've been making the rounds of uh, Togolese um, uh, and West Africans in the U.S., um, to see what their lives are like after they uh, come over. Uh, and they're often, they're, they're, these are often quite sad stories. They, they, they make a living, they have a salary, uh, but they get stuck at very low levels in the economy, at minimum wage for years and years and years, especially if they're Togolese, they don't have uh, English language, their degrees aren't recognized. Um, it's very difficult for them to jump. They work two and three jobs. Uh, and eventually they go back home for a visit after they get their U.S. passport uh, uh, six, seven, eight years later, um, and I've seen many of them back there, and um, they're the happiest people alive. They perform success even though they don't live success here, um, and the day they leave, I've seen several of them uh, with tears in their eyes, not wanting to go back, but of course they have to. And their families would re refuse to take them back in there. They're supposed to be sending money back. They're supposed to be supporting people and so on. Um, so I've been looking at the migrant on both sides, the migrant imaginaries, let's call it, on both sides. Um, and I was in Omaha, um, Nebraska, a couple of weeks ago, uh, which Togolese call Togoville. Um, there are many, many Togolese in Omaha. I won't go into reasons why. It's a very odd place, uh, interesting place um, in the Midwest. Um, and uh, one of the questions I was asking people was, um, so do you experience yourself, do you, A, do you experience racism, and B, do you see yourself as, as raced fundamentally um, here? Um, and there were long, long pauses uh, when people um, answered. Um, and then they would say things like, well, yeah, in one of the jobs I had, they were always picking the white person ahead of me. Um, and, um, but what about your identity? Um, and they would say, you know, we left Togo because we were precarious. Uh, and we're in the States because we're trying to make a living. We're trying to make money and send it back home. That's sort of our, our, our fundamental um, uh, uh, mission here and our identity is tied up with that. Um, at the same time people already, they're, they're absolutely anxious and freaked out about the current moment. Um, all of the people I talk to have papers because when they, I didn't say this earlier, it's, it's totally who win the U.S. diversity visa lottery, so they actually get green cards when they leave. So they have papers. But of course, they live with many people who don't have papers. And they are all um, petrified, um, very scared. Um, and they, 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 they are talking in, in, in ways that I've never heard before about uh, race um, and white supremacy um, in, I think, very important ways. And it will be interesting for me to follow. Th this uh, the very beginning of this sort of project on this side. So my 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 comments are very provisional in that sense. But um, I think it's the beginning of, of, of prop, likely a, a, a sort of deep transformation in their own um, uh, sets of self-understandings. Thanks. <laughs>
My name is John French, and I'm a, uh, a professor of history with a secondary in um, a secondary in African and African American studies, and I also have been very involved for the last five years in uh, a variety of initiatives related to Brazil. And we have 17 Brazilians here, including eight students and a variety of professors and staff that are here for eight days and a conference coming up on Monday about uh, about the access that's been won in the last 15 years of. Uh, racially and economically marginalized youth gaining access to higher education on a scale that hasn't occurred before associated with the left of center government. Uh, and we have here Alvaro Pereira um, de Nascimento, who is a major historian of uh, labor history in Brazil, but particularly has written two very well regarded books on the revolt of the whip in 1910 when sailors, black, black and mulatto sailors, seized the uh, brand new vessels that arrived from England and threatened the uh, to bombard Rio de Janeiro if they didn't abolish the use of the whip. It's a very famous revolt. There's a number of things in English about it. Uh, and Alexander Fortes was also here. He's an historian um, who's part of this project. Uh, in any case, I was, um, you know, we were asked to, is, uh, to reflect on um, Micheline's um, proposal about global blackness, and that's what I did in this paper using a particular uh, Brazilian black activist thinker, uh, Denise Ferreira da Silva. So I want to quickly just, um, let me make sure I stay within my 10 minutes. Um, let me just start off by saying a little bit about uh, my, my work is fundamentally for 38, 38 years I've been working on Brazil. I work in particular on working class and popular classes, struggles, politics, trade unions, um, and so on and so forth. I'm finishing a biography. I just finished the uh, first volume of biography of Lula, Brazil's um, working class president who, um, with the fourth grade education, who won the last four presidential elections in Brazil. Uh, and uh, I also have developed over the 25 years I've been at Duke, I've developed a, you know, a long history and training that's produced many people that have gone, Af young African American students that have gone on to <coughs> become Brazilianists and, and, uh, and so on, as well as a two semester graduate sequence. So if there's any graduate students here, a uh, graduate sequence on Afro-Brazilian history and culture, and we'll be teaching modern 20th century Afro-Brazilian history and uh, culture this coming fall. Um, so what I want to talk about is, you know, there's been a, Brazil has been a, a really the a central part, actually the central dialogue since the 1930s with the U.S. in terms of trying to understand the nature of the different trajectories of race in Latin America versus race, race versus, and it was always thought of that way in the U.S., uh, which for a long time was very much a, you know, mostly a U.S. monologue. Uh, and usually the voices, the only voices that were heard from the Latin American side would tend to be people who were, um, you know, privileged, usually non-subaltern, usually white, like Gilberto Freire, who made a major impact in the 30s and 40s, uh, and so on. What began to happen in the 90s, uh, Afro-North Americans have always been interested in Brazil, it's always been useful as a weapon against segregation here and as a way of thinking as well about what does it mean when more color, when Africa survives in more visible and organized ways in terms of dance, religion, and so on. Uh, and one of the things that's been interesting in the 90s, the, there was a sort of a low point in the, eight, in the 80s, but then in the 90s, really as part of the push towards globalization, internationalization, and so on, including in the field of black studies, there was a, much, a sort of a, an embark on a sort of a diasporic of trying to see beyond. It's also when Gilroy's book came out, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, the new black movements that emerged in the, um, uh, after 1978, uh, which are important, have generated and included an, you know, a variety of people and a variety of perspectives and debates and things which had tended to be marginal. Uh, I would say that's not as true by the late 90s and into the t 2000s. Um, and Denise Ferreira, who was a black activist who, for, who got a PhD in sociology at the University of Pittsburgh, um, is a particularly important and interesting one. She has been a guest here many years ago, so you might have actually met her at some point. Uh, in any case, um, she started, she has a very, um, she talks about herself as sort of a wayward social scientist, and she has a kind of a cultural studies approach, which is not my, uh, my kettle of fish. On the other hand, I'm very open-minded, and there's a, I really want to talk a little bit about the logic of the position that she builds, which seems to me to run parallel with some of the points that's, that's been made by uh, Micheline here. I mean, her big point, one of her big points, you know, and this involves criticizing Omi and Winant's racial formation theory, it involves criticizing Gilroy uh, uh, and postmodernism and the rest of it, is sort of the, you know, a socio, that the socio-historical logic of exclusion is the way to understand the position of black people in, in the societies within which they live. 
Uh, and you know, really, she you know, this is the this is the basis of the critique she makes of. Uh, as well of critical race theory here and so on, that she thinks that this, the assumption that this is the, the logic for understanding, which is the US logic, the exclusion, the exclusion from citizenship, the exclusion from universality, the struggle over that. And the question that she asks is, what about societies where it's not the strategy of racial subordination and abjection is not based upon exclusion, but rather inclusion in hierarchical terms within national narratives? And that that's much more the that's much more the Brazilian case, uh, you know. And this results in a, because if you take the first case, then it's a matter of uh, the understandings among you know Brazil is roughly in terms of the census, it's roughly 51% preto or pardo, which would be people that we would tend to want to put into one single category as black. Um, probably from U.S. point of view, many more people in Brazil are black than 50%. Uh, and so on and so forth. But if you think about it as exclusion, then you end up with uh, you end up with this notion that their understandings that they have involve some sort of capitulation to a dominant ideology of racial democracy, a set of lies that made you know Brazilian racial inequality, because Brazil is actually racially much more unequal than the U.S. and yet characterized by less racial conflict, less explicit, less conflict related to race in terms of explicitly formulated in those terms. Um, so she goes on to the way what she says she's interested in you know, using the Brazilian case, trying to think about the Brazilian conceptualization, she talks about trying to conceive of and understand a non-Du Boisian black consciousness, one not, defended by a, not defined by a quest for transparency and an end to exclusion. And as she says, what if racial subjection can operate, uh, as in Brazil, based on a not purely exclusionary principle? And here she ends up with, uh, you know, developing an idea which actually um, goes back a long way, it goes back to an important, um, uh, black activist intellectual in the 1950s, Guerrero Ramos, which is really the idea, a distinctive idea, which is very much part of sort of a, a, a vector within the black movements in Brazil about race as a territory and blackness as a place, not a race, as a terrain uh, that's, you know, a terrain of, that's um, uh, not fully uh, incorporated. And she, you know, she has a number of articles in her early work. I won't talk about her recent work where she talks about these things. She has a comparison of the Amida. I mean, the Diallo case and the police murders in Rio's favelas, where she talks about the differences between the regions of modern space, those who fall within universal justice and those who fall outside of it. Uh, you know, and then thus she sort of suggests, she suggests that the clash over race uh, can be seen at a more abstract level, taking into account national realities, less as a conflict between whites and blacks per se, and more as a con uh, contrast between spaces coded white and those coded black. For example, the Baixada, where our students are coming from, which is about three million people, is you know 70 percent pardo and preto. Uh, on the other hand, there's also th there's also a lot of people there and a lot of African descended people there that are white in appearance and things like that. The stigma, the difficulties, the enormous violence, the um, you know the the very hostile conditions and, the, and neglect to which uh, the whole region is subjected, sort of makes the region the Baixada sort of a, exactly that idea of a black a black space, a black territory. Uh, in that sense. Uh, and she, you know, she goes on from there, and I'll let me just see how I'm doing. I've got three minutes. Um, to talk a little bit about the, um, you know, the, the, you know, she's really talking about the idea that there's sort of the domain of illegality and zones of violence, which would be the Baixada, favelas, and so on, you know, which to us often look like fairly straightforward black spaces and white spaces in terms of race, understood as race, uh, what we, the, our understands, uh, understanding of that. Uh, you know, but she, the point she wants to make is that she thinks that this, the race category of police violence, for example, she said, is made perverse and elusive because the poor is a category that combines the effect of class and race subjective, therefore binding both of them in social collectivities that include black mestizo and black and white Brazilians. Uh, and this is the way um, she wants us to think about it. So she says, you know, and then she has this observation that many North Americans comment, and it is a very, you know, a, a very common comment about the silencing of race under, the racial underclass in Brazil. And she says, yes, but what about the equally problematic and parallel silencing of class under race in the U.S., which is sort of Higginbotham's meta, her theory about the, uh, you know, meta language of class by which we express things that are really about 
socioeconomic and structural inequalities that are not about race, but here we discuss them through race in the same way that in Brazil they discuss questions of race, which is why you get this confusion between the poor and black people. People use the terms interchangeably and they mean the same thing, except that you say, but yeah, but that's ambiguous. What do you mean? You can, you're just the same two sentences. You say the poor are, are, are mistreated by the police, and the next sentence you say the blacks are mistreated by the police, and you mean the same thing. Why aren't you systematizing your labels as opposed to this idea of, and then from there, she also goes, you know, she cites various examples from the formulations of black activist movements, uh, you know, about how they choose to formulate um, pol their political line and things like that, which is often uh, in ways that seem a little bit surprising to us. One of the major initiatives for f the fight for expanding access to higher education, as well as the victories that Brazil has experienced in terms of racial quotas, um, racial and as well as quotas that you could argue are class quotas, you know, is Frei David of Educafro, who's a liberation theology priest who started out in the 1970s working in the Baixada where we are and still linked to the Baixada. But he, what he did when he was to create a, a, a program for training people to take the entrance exam to colleges, but he doesn't call it a black program. He calls it a, ne a needy and black people's pre-vestibular program because it actually makes that, that breadth of openness was important in terms of this notion of, because some black movements had taken the argument that the way to solve the problem is if we could force everybody to say they're black, then we would have the problem solved. Except that when you get all the subjectivities involved with what does it mean, what does blackness mean, all the varieties, all the questions of appearances and the differences in, within families and, you know, and the advantages that accrue, you know, the work of Elizabeth Horace Freeman is quite moving in terms of that. So the final thing, I'll, I'll just end with a, a, quick, a, a quick point about uh, just using a quote from, uh, uh, you know, the idea that Guerrero Ramos launched in the 50s was about the negro como lugar, the black as a, as a place. You know, and in a black intellectual, a really famous um, black activist intellectual, Joel Rufino dos Santos, who just recently died, he formulated it in the 90s in the following way. He said, um, he's talking about that and trying to how to define it. And he says, the black in Brazil should be seen as a social configuration, a place that can be occupied even by non-blacks, just like the place of whites can be occupied by a preto or a mulatto. The police force, by the way, which is enormously violent in Brazil, is heavily black and mulatto, especially at the <laughs> lowest levels and things like that. He says, how to define this place, if black as a place, how to define it? He said the coordinates to fix the black as a place would be phenotype, in other words, your appearance, mostly criollo, which is a term used for black, social condition, poor, cultural patrimony, popular, historical origin, African ancestors, and identity, whether self-definition or identification by others. He says the weakest coordinate of all of these about what is the black as a place is the phenotype, since he says the majority of our population tends towards the dark. Uh, the Brazilian is, and this is sort of the final gesture, very characteristic of black movements and black discourse in general, that the black, Brazilian is, as one can deduce, the best synonym for black, and white is the synonym for non-Brazilians.